Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Brain Imaging in the Modern Era. My name is Danny Shapiro, and I'm on the marketing team here at Hawks Learning. Our speaker today is Dr. Lori Slifka of Kaiser University. Dr. Slifka has authored questions for our Introduction to Psychology course. We arranged this webinar so that she can share some of her expertise with you, other psychology instructors from across the country. At Hawks, we understand the value of partnering with faculty in order to create and maintain high quality course materials. We believe that your expert insight is invaluable, and that is how we came to connect with Dr. Slifka. Dr. Slifka is a research neuropsychologist with specific expertise in health conditions such as human immunodeficiency virus and early life stress that primarily impact brain structures deep beneath the surface of the cerebral cortex. A majority of her research studies incorporate neuropsychological tests and structural Im neuroimaging. She has also developed research protocols and statistical analysis plans, designed neuropsychological batteries, and created databases for integration of clinical neuroimaging and neuropsychological data. Dr. Slifka has been funded by the National Institutes of Health for her work investigating brain integrity in individuals with human immunodeficiency virus. Additionally, Dr. Slifka has contributed to numerous peer review publications and presented work at international conferences. She currently serves as an ad hoc reviewer for several peer review journals, including Psychiatry Research Neuroimaging, Behavioral Brain Research, Journal of the International Neuropsychological Society, and Neurobiology of Aging. Dr. Slifka has a passion for teaching and utilizes her abundant training and research experiences to inform and greatly enrich her teaching and mentoring practices. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please enter those into the Q&A box located on the panel, either at the top or bottom of your screen, and we will address them at the end of the talk. And on that note, I would like to hand it over to our presenter. Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for that very warm welcome, Danny. I appreciate it. Um, we are going to be talking about brain imaging in the modern era. This is also known as neuroimaging, which I'm going to refer to brain imaging as neuroimaging uh, throughout the course of the presentation. So I wanted to start off by telling you a little bit about myself, but Danny did a really good job hitting um, most everything I was going to tell you, um, but just a little bit more of a brief background. Uh, I have my PhD in psychology with an emphasis in behavioral neuroscience from the University of Missouri-St. Louis. I currently serve as a professor of psychology at Kaiser University, um, located in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and specifically I work with graduate students, um, primarily in a teaching role uh, for master's and doctoral students in psychology and industrial organizational psychology. I hate the word expertise because it's really tough to be an expert in the entire literature base. So I like to say I know a lot um, about various health conditions, such as human, human immunodeficiency virus or HIV, early life stress and aging. These may sound very diverse and they are. What they have in common is they all primarily impact similar areas of the brain. We're gonna go into some brain anatomy, but essentially if you flip the brain over, um, that area of the brain is called the subcortex, and all of these impact that area of the brain. The way that I do this is through neuropsychological testing, so cognitive testing, essentially, um, and neuroimaging, which is what we're going to talk about. The primary neuroimaging technique that I use is called diffusion tensor imaging. It's a structural neuroimaging technique, and we're going to go into some detail on that. I might tell you, or I'll tell you the same thing I tell my students. Uh, here's a link to my research articles. I always tell them that if you are having trouble falling asleep, there you go, there's the link. And something else I tell my students um, is that uh, I know a lot about the brain, I know a lot about neuroimaging, um, but I don't know everything. So if you have a question I can't answer it for you, um, happy to look it up and discuss it at a later date. So let's go ahead and get started. All right. I'm getting used to the webinar, so please excuse any technical errors. All right, so what we're gonna do, we're gonna uh, first talk a little bit about the human brain. Um, for majority of you, um, imagine this will be a review, but we're gonna go over, over some basics, which will 
um, help when we go into the neuroimaging component. We're gonna talk about some principles of neuroimaging techniques. Um, we're not gonna talk about all of them because there are a lot out there as you'll see, um, but we're gonna talk about some of the main ones that are used in psychology. And then we're gonna talk about some of the applications in the field of psychology. But what I do wanna say about that is within the principles of the neuroimaging technique section, um, we are gonna integrate that uh, with applications in the field of psychology as well. So let's start off by talking about the human brain. So I know you can't respond to me right now, um, but I just want you to read this over. Um, I wrote it earlier today and we, as a group of very highly educated individuals here, so I was hoping that you could just, you know, take a look at it, maybe provide me with some comments, some edits, let me know what you think. So I'll give you a second so you can read over this. All right. Thoughts? Why did I show you this? You're like, oh no. <laughs> This speaker doesn't know what she's doing. Well, I showed you this because although the um, words are the, the um, there, it's not in the right order, you can still read it. So I bet you could read according to research at Cambridge University. It doesn't matter in what order the letters and the word are. The only important thing is that the first and last letter, et cetera, et cetera. And that's pretty amazing, right? This provides an example of how fascinating the human brain is. Our brain was able to do that. And not only was our brain able to do that, but it's doing a lot of different things at the same time. You are listening to me, you're reading this, you're breathing. All of these things are happening simultaneously. So this is an image of what the human brain looks like. It weighs about three pounds. Uh, so if you picture a bag of rice at the store, um, the average size of a bag of rice would be about the size of a human brain. But the brain consistency is a little bit more like pudding. Um, like pudding, it's made of water, fats, proteins. But unlike pudding, it's very systematically structured and organized. This allows for the complexity, which we just demonstrated in the example. There are so many things happening simultaneously all of the time. Your brain has the ability to complete a task like it just did on top of monitoring basic life support systems receiving and interpreting sensory information, storing information, problem solving, creating new ideas, all simultaneously. It's pretty crazy, right? So how does this small package provide such a powerful punch? Well, neurons, otherwise known as nerve cells. Neurons are essentially the building blocks of the brain. Um, we have Two types of cells in our brain, we have neurons and glial cells. We're going to focus on neurons for this talk, um, but they're the building blocks. The brain's estimated to contain about 100 billion neurons. It's definitely a rough estimate. Um, and it creates this highly sophisticated organization and system of communication. And each neuron has a lot of connections. Each neuron's estimated to have about 7,000 synaptic connections, giving us like 700 trillion connections. And there are three main parts of the neuron, okay? And this is how I typically explain it to my intro behavioral neuroscience students um, and intro psych, which I haven't taught in a long time. But if you take your hand and you stretch it out, um, I'm not sure how much of me is in the shot right now, but essentially if you put your hand out, um, we can use this to model a neuron. Your palm like here would represent the cell body. This provides energy to the cell. So if you wanna compare this to your cell phone, it would be like the battery of your cell phone. Your fingers are what would be the dendrites. Um, dendrites bring information into a neuron. I like to think of it as the listening end, so they're listening to other neurons. And if you think of your cell phone again, 20 years ago, it's like the antenna. <laughs> um, your arm represents the axon. Every cell has an axon, and the purpose is to send messages out of the cell. So if you think of your cell phone, your axon would be the transmitter. Axons are often wrapped in a fatty protective coating called myelin. So if you think of the protective rubber coating on the wires of your TV, just like those wires, myelin will help messages move along the axon quickly and cleanly. 
So why am, I, why am I talking about neurons? We're getting there now. So the brain is made up of two main types of tissue that are composed of neurons. And neurons are what are the distinguishing factor between the two types of brain tissue. So there's gray matter, um, and that makes up the surface of the cortex, so it's generally what you can see. And it's made up of your hand, the cell bodies, the axon terminals, which are at the end of the axon, and the dendrites, which is the listening end. Um, it's, the gray matter translates sensory information to the body and receives into chemical data um, that the brain synapses, which is the um, area in between each neuron. It's what they can interpret. White matter is the long strands of a neuron's extensions, or the arm, the axons. The axons will carry information from one gray matter region to another, essentially making it the brain's messenger system. Uh, so when we see those pretty pictures, like the one on the bottom right, like uh, it's the album cover for Muse, which I think came out like five years ago, but it's this very pretty picture. That's actually white matter bundles. So bundles of axons moving together to connect various parts of the brain. So let's bring in another example of that. So another way we can think of gray matter and white matter is that gray matter is essentially like a city. So I live in South Florida. And we have a lot of main cities down here. Um, we have Miami, Fort Lauderdale, West Palm Beach. And the gray matter would essentially be each individual city. There's some traffic. Well, there's a lot of traffic in Miami, but there's traffic within each individual city. And then there's, a, uh, well, there's two main highways that connect those three main cities, Fort Lauderdale, Miami, and West Palm Beach. That would be our white matter. So white matter is all about rapid, long distance signaling from one city to another, very much like a highway expressway. If there's any traffic going from Fort Lauderdale to Miami, it's gonna take you longer to get there. If there's some sort of accident or blockage or whatnot. This is kind of how we think of white matter integrity. I'm gonna say white matter integrity throughout this talk. So if there's reduced integrity, so there's any issues with the white matter could be caused um, from disease, then there would be some congestion and the speed from getting to Fort Lauderdale, from Fort Lauderdale to Miami would be slower than it would be if there wasn't any traffic backup or congestion. So a little bit more, um, these are, this is very basic neuroscience information, um, but just wanted to talk about it so we're all on the same page. But essentially the brain is composed of two hemispheres, the left and the right. It's connected by a white matter track, corpus callosum, thick white matter fiber bundle. Um, and there are four main lobes of the brain. I talked about the subcortex. So the lobes are known as the cortex. If you flip this brain over, we get the subcortex and there's a ton of different structures under there. Very important for motor skills and emotions, we're just going to talk about these four lobes for now. The frontal lobe um, is important for conscious thought, executive function, which is really an umbrella term for um, decision-making, planning, organization, high, higher level cognitive functionings, those that typically develop later in life. So it's sometimes what you see adolescents struggle with. Um, and motor. Parietal lobe is important for sensory information. Temporal lobe is important for auditory information and memory. And the occipital lobe is important for vis vision. We also have uh, four ventricles in the brain. These house the cerebral spinal fluid. Um, we have two lateral ventricles, a third ventricle, and a fourth ventricle. And why I'm bringing up the ventricles is you're gonna see on some of these scans that I show you that the ventricles will essentially enlarge, there'll be more cerebral spinal fluid to fill up the brain if there's any sort of brain atrophy. So we know our brain is in our skull, and if there's, I'm gonna to refer to atrophy of the brain, and various diseases will lead to atrophy, but it's not like your brain shrinks in your skull. Cerebral spinal fluid can help fill that out, okay? So we reviewed some of the basics of the brain, so let's talk about how we can examine them in vivo. So in vivo, meaning in living individuals. So neuroimaging includes the use, this is very broad, admittedly, but it includes the use of various techniques to either directly or indirectly uh, image the structure and the function of the brain. 
generally separated into two major categories. There's also recording, which we're not going to talk about um, during this talk, but there's structural neuroimaging, uh, which is what I was talking about when I talked about diffusion tensor imaging, and there's functional neuroimaging. And there are a number of different modalities for performing each category. And we can image individual neuron, we can individual brain networks, we can individual ind or image individual structures of the brain and the whole brain. We would be here all day if we talked about all of these techniques. So I'm not going to, but I wanted to give you an idea of how many neuroimaging techniques are out there. And this is not an inclusive list. There are definitely more out there, but just as a visual image of all of the different neuroimaging techniques you can use to examine the brain in vivo. And we've come a really, really long way in the last, well, really in the last 40 years, we've really advanced our technology, but in about the last 120 years, we've really come from pretty unsafe uh, methods to uh, examine the brain in vivo to um, fairly, well, actually to very safe methods um, of examining the brain. So I just want to go into how we typically, how we study the brain before the era of neuroimaging. And keep in mind, these are ways that we still study the brain. So this isn't like we used to do this and now we don't. But neuroimaging is a supplement and it can help us to gather more information about the brain. Um, so for many years, scientists seeking to understand information about structure and function of the brain really had indirect methods of doing so. So for example, you can see here there's brain cutting. So you can perform post-mortem dissections of the brain in healthy individuals and individuals who had displayed specific functional deficits. So maybe problems with memory um, could be that are caused by potentially like localized brain regions. So if it's a problem with memory, possibly it's due to some damage to an area of the brain important for memory called the hippocampus. Um, and from examining the brain post-mortem, scientists are able to make inferences about particular roles. Animal studies and well, as well are, is another investigative method. Um, so if you selectively destroy certain parts of the brain in animal subjects, you can kind of confirm the role of certain brain structures. Um, and then you can apply that to a human model. Again, we still do this. And then neuropsychological testing, which now is often used in conjunction with neuroimaging, but you can give an individual, it could be a patient or a participant, if it's a research study, um, different cognitive tests that are used to um, essentially infer about function of different areas of the brain. So I'm going to go over a little bit of history of the neuroimaging era. This does not include everything. It's just a brief overview. So beginning in the early 1900s um, is when neuroimaging really started to come about. Um, pneumoencephalography um, was one of the first main neuroimaging techniques in vivo that was used. Um, it's a medical imaging technique in which cerebral spinal fluid, so what's housed in those ventricles, is drained um, and replaced with air oxygen, helium, to allow the structures of the brain to show up more clearly on x-ray. It um, was actually introduced in 1919, but then it was utilized in the 1930s by Walter Dandy. He was a neuro neurosurgeon. Uh, it was performed um, around this time, but it was extremely painful, and researchers later discovered that it was really dangerous, and it, so overall it was not well tolerated. Um, cerebral angiography, which is still used, it's essentially um, the ability to generate images of blood vessels in and around the brain. 1970s and 80s was a really big time for up and coming neuroimaging <laughs> methods. Um, a lot of the methods we use today were developed around that time. Although they were developed then, we have made a lot of advancements in these um, and we continue to. Um, computed tomography or CT scan, we're going to talk about that in depth. Magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI, positron emission tomography, PET, and functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI. A little bit later came um, diffusion tensor imaging, or DTI. 
These are going to be the main, main ones that we discussed. Um, they're widely used in psychology research, but as you can see from the list that I showed, this by no means is an inclusive list of all different technology. So structural imaging um, deals with the structure of the brain. So it can show a contrast between different tissues, cerebral spinal fluid, gray matter, and white matter. The types we're gonna discuss, and I'm gonna use the abbreviations, um, CT, MRI, and DTI. <clears throat> All right, so computed tomography or CT, you've probably heard of, maybe you've had one. Um, they can be used for various areas of the body, not just the brain, but we're gonna talk about how it's used for the brain. Um, so it essentially builds up a picture of the brain based on differential absorption of x-ray. So this technique is going to use x-ray, so you have to think about radiation. So during a CT scan, um, a patient or participant will lie on a table, slides in and out of this Hollander cylinder apparatus. Um, an x-ray source will ride a ring around the inside of the tube with the beam aimed at the person's head. Um, after passing through the head, the beam is sampled by one of the detectors that line the machine circumference. Uh, and then images made using x-rays depend on the absorption of the beam by the tissue that it passes through. This is how it's able to distinguish between the different types of tissue. So bone and hard tissue will absorb the x-ray well. Um, air and water absorb very little and soft tissue is somewhere in between. So the CT is really what we're seeing in terms of those color differences is the difference in the tissue. And CTs are really good at revealing gross features of the brain. So if there's some sort of injury or tumor or lesion or infarction from a stroke, it's really gr good at that gross detection or more macroscop macroscopic detection. The MRI um, is a very, very widely used um, technique to image the brain. It houses a very powerful magnet. And this is a very complex technology, but I'm gonna try to give you a more simplified overview here. So magnets are central to MRI, but they're quite a bit stronger. So roughly about 1,000 to 3,000 times stronger than the average refrigerator magnet. So one of the concerns with this imaging technology, or one of the things to think about, is somebody going in that scanner cannot have anything that would react to the magnetic field um, that will pull. Um, the magnetic field in the scanner uh, interacts with protons in our hydrogen atoms. That's really handy because um, we're made up of 70% water. So there's plenty of hydrogen atoms for um, the magnet to affect. So using these protons, so, so usually these protons are facing in random directions. You can see that in that first um, image on the bottom of the screen. Uh, and then the magnetic field makes a significant portion of them align in the same direction. So you see that um, in the next image to the right. So if we're lying in the MRI machine, the protons and the hydrogen atoms, which is from the water in our body, mostly pointing in the same way. So that's what the magnet does. And then this, something called a radio pulse is emitted. It's like a normal radio signal, but a lot quicker. And this interacts with the proteins, essentially turning on them on their side, like you see in that picture. That radio frequency pulse happens for a moment, and then the protons relax back to their aligned state as they were before. And this is the really crucial part. So as they relax, energy is released that can be detected by the sensors on the MRI scanner. And then there are very complex calculations that take place. And the computer can de determine what the tissue looks like, depending on the energy that's been released. And that shows us the image of the tissue. And we're able to distinguish between white matter, gray matter, cerebral spinal fluid. And it gives us a more detailed image than CT scans. So here are just some examples. Um, of MRI scans and research studies that have used MRI scans to reveal some features about the brain in individuals that are healthy and then have some sort of pathology. So if you look at the picture on the left, the one that's 20s, 80s, aging gracefully, 80s with mild Alzheimer's, um, the one on the left shows what a brain may look like in the 20, in their, in, when someone's in their 20s. And then you 
go to the middle and it reveals what healthy aging may look like. So you can see that the ventricles have expanded a bit because there's been some atrophy in the cortex, which is typical with normal aging. And then in the last picture, you see more extreme atrophy, which happens from Alzheimer's disease. And you see that the ventricles have gotten even larger to make up for that area. On the right, we see a comparison between an individual that's diagnosed with probable Alzheimer's disease, and that's on the left, compared to a 14-year-old that's experienced a severe traumatic brain injury. And then on the far right is a 14-year-old control. So what's cool about this image is that you can see on the top panel what the MRI scan looks like compared to what the brain in the skull would look like. So you can see um, the differences in the folds at the top of the brain. So particularly, I can't really point here, but so particularly in the um, one on the right, you see less pronounced folds as the ones on the left side when there's been some cortical atrophy. So this MRI technology can tell us about um, the whole brain, and we can also use mathematical calculations to examine individual structures. And often in neuroimaging studies, um, you can take a group of individuals, say we're looking at Alzheimer's um, versus people that don't have Alzheimer's, and you can actually measure the size of the individual structures. So say you're looking at the size of the hippocampus, and then you can look to determine if there's a significant difference between the size of the different structures in individuals with Alzheimer's disease and without. So CT and MRI, uh, both used in neuroscience. Let's talk a little bit about the pros and cons of each technique. So CT is generally very fast. Um, you can get, the, there has been significant advances in CT technology and you can get images very, very, very rapidly. Well, and MRI takes a longer amount of time. Um, CT has poor soft tissue resolution while MRI, especially the ones now, um, we keep advancing the technology and there's this very exquisite anatomical detail. Um, CT is readily available, especially in an emergency situation. Um, MRIs are definitely more expensive. Um, CTs are less sensitive to a patient motion. So if a patient's moving around in the scanner, and when I say patient, I mean, think of patient, so for a clinical scan or participant, like a research participant, kind of interchangeably here. But it's less sensitive to motion while MRI is very sensitive to motion. So that can really mess up the image you get if there's a lot of motion in the um, MRI scanner. There's not too extreme the screening with the CT. There's really extensive screening that has to take place with an MRI. Any metal in the body can be pulled out. So pacemaker, uh, uh, metal implant, and also um, some individuals experience claustrophobia in an MRI. CT uses some radiation while MRI doesn't. And MRI can image in any imaging plane. You can see three different imaging planes at the bottom right without moving the patient physically. So diffusion tensor imaging, which I was talking about at the beginning. Um, so MRI really focuses on gray matter of the brain. So traditional MRI that we just talked about, the bodies of the neurons and the dendrites. DTI focuses on the bundles of axons. Um, so it's essentially focusing on that highway system. And this is a technique that's used within an MRI scanner. So you can generate information about the health of the white matter when somebody undergoes an MRI scan. It's like a separate addition to the MRI scan. And it maps white matter fiber tracts in the brain by measuring the diffusion of water molecules. Typically, water will diffuse more quickly along an axon than across it. Okay, so we're measuring water diffusion along various axons. And there are various um, ways that we can quantify this integrity. Um, they're all physics-based. It's uh, fractional anisotropy, mean diffusivity, axial diffusivity, diffusivity, and radial diffusivity. I want to talk a little bit about fractional anisotropy because we're going to go back to that um, at the end. Um, but it's one way we measure the strength of these white matter tracks or these highway systems. 
It's essentially an indirect measure of the track strength. It's reported um, in values between zero and one. It tells us how much water is able to diffuse in a particular white matter track. Zero indicates um, unrestricted, so like no restricted diffusion, so water can kind of go wherever it wants. That's not really what we want in a track, because that means the track is disrupted. Um, the idea, the higher the FA value, or the fractional anisotropy value, the more organized the track is. So the more restricted the water flow is around the, or along the track. So it can be interpreted in the context of what braiding regions the track connects. And I always get asked about these colors. Um, they're, very, they're very pretty, but they essentially just indicate direction that the track is going. So red is tracks that go run left to right in the brain. Um, green is anterior to posterior, so front to back. And then blue is superior to inferior. Uh, here are some um, images from uh, various research studies using diffusion tensor imaging. So the one on the left is individuals, uh, an individual without traumatic brain injury, and then the one on the right is an individual with traumatic brain injury. And then, so that's at the top, at the bottom you see a conventional MRI. And what you see from that is the conventional MRI doesn't reveal the extent of the structural abnormalities in this particular area of the brain. Um, and then on the right, we see a particular track in a healthy control and then someone with amnestic uh, mild cognitive impairment. There's not that much of a difference there in the image, but it is cool to be able to visualize what this scan can give us when we're looking at differences between individuals. Okay, so let's get into Functional neuroimaging, it's used to indirectly measure brain functions. So essentially make inferences about neural activity in the brain. Um, the two techniques we're gonna talk about are functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI, and positron emission tomography, or PET scan. You see on the top would be an example of fMRI, and the bottom would be an example of PET scan. So functional MRI um, really depends on functional localization. So you may ask why I have an image of phrenology. <laughs> You're like, oh, we, we don't really talk about phrenology anymore. And yes, that's true. But if you go back to the history of neuroscience, it's actually very interesting because we went from a place that we believed that cognitive functions and thoughts were in the heart. And now we are advanced to understanding the brain works in terms of network. But somewhere along the way, there was a development it was in the 19th century, but there was a development of phrenology. And this essentially led us to localization of brain function, that specific areas of the brain were important for specific, um, specific functions. And so we don't really, we don't rely on phrenology now, but it really did set the course for this. And it's kind of like the foundation, if you think about it, of fMRI determining um, the functions of various parts of the brain using um, this technology. So fMRI works on the magnetic properties of neurons. So as with all other cells, neurons require energy to function. In neurons, glucose and oxygen provide energy, which is delivered by the bloodstream. Molecules in the blood that carry oxygen differ in their magnetic properties, depending on their amount of oxygenation. So differing levels of Oxygenation and deoxygenization results in magnetic signals that the fMRI measures. So this process is referred to blood oxygenization level dependent or bold. So if you've heard of a bold scan. So what this does is it gives us an indirect measure of neuronal activity. So essentially what we can infer, and there's some controversy in the field about fMRI, um, but from looking at like a scan that's at the bottom, you can infer the neural activity that's taking place at rest or when somebody is completing a particular task. And we're able to construct maps of neural networks from this technology. It's important to note this measures secondary uh, physiological correlates of neural activity. It's not a direct measure. So it means it's not a truly quantitative measure of mental activity. So when we compare fMRI response between individuals, it's impossible to say whether the differences are neural or physiological. Even. 
so here are just some visual images from the literature um, using fMRI. So on the left, you see activity um, differences in the brain between individuals that are classified as not stressed compared to stress. So you see um, differential organization between these two groups. And then this would be during a task-based MRI. And then on the right, what we see is um, what our brain looks like at rest. It's um, called the default mode network. So we're looking at the de default mode mode network connectivity and mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease. So this is showing differences between healthy individuals, those with mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease and difference in function um, at rest. So here's an example of what a task-based MRI may look like. Um, this image does, I admit, look a little bit outdated, um, but nonetheless fun. So it's a basic experimental paradigm um, used to study retrieval success. So subjects are asked to recognize previously studied old and new words. So um, they study different words like pre-scanner, like they study the word ketchup. Ketchup is one of the words that they've seen before. And then um, in the scanner, they're asked to recognize old words, so words that they've already seen, and distinguish that between new words. So the items that are correctly remembered as old are directly compared with the rejected new items, and that determines a correlate, essentially, of retrieval success. And then the brain will show the correlates that are active during that time, which you see in the image on the right. Another type of functional neuroimaging that also produces very pretty pictures is uh, PET, or positron emission tomography. It's a nuclear imaging technique. It also is used to measure and map the brain activities. Also, fortunately, quite complex. And it involves injection of radioactive substance, okay? So PET scans will essentially measure blood flow in the brain by injecting small amounts of radioactive substances and then scanning the absorption of the radioactivity. As that radioactive substance decays, it releases gamma rays that the PET technology measures. That provides us a picture that we see. And that provides a contrast between areas that are more and less active. So if you look at the picture at the bottom, the computer demonstrates uh, the areas by colors. Red indicates more active areas, blue indicates less active areas. So a bit of a comparison between the two main functional uh, neuroimaging techniques. Um, fMRI, similar to traditional fMRI, is sensitive to movement. PET is less sensitive. Um, there, you're also going to get that really exquisite anatomical detail in the fMRI, and you're not going to get that in the PET scan. I say less expensive. It's still expensive, but less expensive than PET fMRI is. Um, PET is expensive. It requires a special machine, radioactive isotopes, and multiple trials to get the scan. fMRI has no radiation. PET does, that's how it works, radioactive isotopes. Um, screenings required for fMRI, because you are using that magnet, that magnet technology. Um, and then in terms of PET scan, PET is good at um, locating a more generalized area of activity, but not as specific as fMRI. All right, so we're gonna talk about some applications we already have along the way. And the applications that I put up are very generalized because these are used depending on how you think about it. If you, and I know we have a very diverse audience. You think about it, how they're used clinically versus how they're used for research. There's some discrepancies, there's some similarities. And I put up some of the ways that they can be used but this is not all of them by any means. So I wanna go over that briefly and then I wanna do a case study um, and that'll wrap us up. But just briefly, so CTs are used, they can help with diagnosis of conditions and study like gross details. So if somebody comes in with a suspected stroke or tumor, that can be very helpful in that case. They are cheaper than MRI, so they are readily used in emergency situations. Um, not 
as widely used in research now because we do have MRI technology. MRI is involved in research in a variety of different conditions. I put up some, but think of all of the different types of conditions that we study. It helps us to understand the structure of the brain, also aid in diagnosis of various conditions. Diffusion tensor imaging, also research on a lot of different conditions, particularly those that can impact white matter. So multiple sclerosis, traumatic brain injury can impact the white matter integrity. Aid in diagnosis, and then those colorful white matter uh, maps can be used for surgical planning, can be really helpful for the surgeon so they know where to cut. Also helps us understand disease based on networks throughout the brain. We're really in this network-based model when we think of um, neuroscience now. We're thinking of how the brain works together, aside from just looking at individual function of different structures. fMRI, same, research on a variety of different conditions, um, can help us understand areas of the brain that are associated with cognition, and also understanding disease based on networks. PET scan, it's been used recently to aid in the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Um, also evaluate and understand other brain disorders such as tumors, Alzheimer's disease, and seizures. So I wanna end by doing a case study. This may be familiar to some of you, may not be familiar to others. I'm going to walk you through it. There is an end goal here. So when you see the beginning, you may think, what the heck are we doing? But I promise there is an end goal. And it's a little, I think it's fun. So I'm a research neuropsychologist, not a clinical neuropsychologist. They don't have a clinical degree. So I don't actually work to diagnose patients. I study um, brain and behavior in various conditions. But just for the purpose of this, we are going to assume the role of clinical neuropsychologists. We're going to assume the role, and not literally, um, but that a patient comes in and we are going to work together to diagnose or help with diagnosis of this particular patient. Okay. So we have a patient. The patient's name is KB. He is a 59 year old male. He's a lawyer, he's married, and he came in because his family had some complaints. And his family talked to, um, specifically his wife, talked to us about this. Um, they said he has some, or she said that he had some changes in his behavior, um, including embezzling money at work, making inappropriate comments to female employees. There's been a deterioration in his work quality, gained 15 pounds very rapidly. And when he eats, he insists on eating food from his plate in a particular order, often with his hands, okay? So we asked about what he was like prior to these changes, and she said that he was an extrovert, pleasant, hardworking, and very social. Uh, in terms of medical history, family history, he had no history of any sort of head trauma, alcohol, or other substance use disorders, um, exposure to toxins, or any psychiatric or medical disease. So very clean bill of health with him. Um, however, uh, it was indicated that a similar clinical condition was described in two of his uncles with the onset in the sixth decade, and both of them had died. So he's 59, that's really close. So when he came in for assessment, he was alert, fully oriented, cooperated, his speech pace was a little bit slow, probably unlike mine. Uh, his spontaneous attention seemed impaired, had a blunt affect, um, and didn't seem to really have insight into his condition. He was given the mini mental state exam, which is a screening measure. Um, it includes a variety of different cognitive domains, but just it's like a brief screen of each cognitive domain. It can give a clinician indication that there may be something going on. Um, so healthy brain should be scoring 27 or above, essentially on this test. If there's a lower, and it varies a little bit, but if you see something lower, it could be suspected that something's going on. So in addition to this initial screening, he was given a wide array of cognitive testing. Um, he did better on some tests than others. So he scored below average, and this is um, compared to um, matched age, uh, education, sex, race, 
below average on executive function, so that frontal lobe functioning, verbal fluency, which is also more of a frontally mediated task, and speed of processing. He was scored average on both immediate, which is more of a frontally mediated task. So if I give you a list of words and then ask you to immediately recall them, that would be immediate memory. And then also average on delayed. Delayed um, would be if I give you that list of words and then I ask you in about 25 minutes to recall as many words as you can. Um, that would be more hippocampal or temporal lobe functioning. He had above average IQ and visuospatial skills, which are more parietal occipital functioning. So now we get to the fun part. So he had neuroimaging scans done. And there was some atrophy, primarily in the orbital frontal cortex, which that arrow is pointing to, it's in the frontal lobe, and some evidence of temporal atrophy too. So we went back, we talked about lobes. So some evidence of that in the temporal lobe. And then here's our term, fractional anisotropy. So this is measuring the integrity of white matter. So with zero being the lowest, so water able to diffuse anywhere it wants to go, and one being um, higher, better, so um, diffusion along the track. So he had slightly lower than expected uh, fractional anisotropy in several white matter tracks that transverse the frontal lobe. And specifically, ones that front went from frontal to occipital and frontal to temporal. So here's all of our evidence. This is what we have to work with for diagnosing this patient. I think you guys can type in the chat. So before I put up what the diagnosis is or what he was diagnosed with, I will give you a chance. I can't see the chat now, but in case you want to try, I'll give you a second to type in the chat and then we'll go over it. Oh, I can see the chat. I have some blinking. I'll give you a couple more seconds. All righty. So the diagnosis, oh, they came in. They all came in. Okay, hopefully I didn't reveal it too fast. The diagnosis is frontal temporal dementia, probable diagnosis, or FTD. So the evidence that we got from the neuropsychological test, the family history, the medical history, behavioral changes have led us here. So it generally begins between the ages of 45 and 65. Our patient is 59, marked by changes in personality, behavior, and affect. Um, loss of insight, perseverative, stereotypical behaviors, changes in eating habit, habits, disrupted speech, fluency, and executive function. Um, those are what we saw in the neuropsychological test. So before we got to neuroimaging, we had some indications that it was frontal temporal dementia by the personality changes, by the age that it was happening, um, by the scores on the neuropsychological test, but the neuropsychological tests were a little bit mixed. So in terms of temporal lobe functioning, we saw that he was scoring about average in memory, um, in both frontally mediated memory and temporally mediated memory. Um, he was scoring lower on some aspects of front, uh, uh, frontal tasks, but we didn't really have that clear of an answer. Maybe we did, but the point is the neuroimaging really helped us here. So we had some evidence to bring us to what this possibly is, but then the neuroimaging really revealed these abnormalities in frontal and temporal lobes, which kind of sealed the deal on the diagnosis. So that helped supplement the other tests that were being used. So that is all I have. Um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to stay. I also provided you with um, my Gmail, just to keep work um, separate. Um, but please feel free to get in touch with me um, if you want to chat, have any questions. I see that the chat is going off. Um, let me take a look. I see uh, 
frontal temporal dementia in there. Do I? I thought I did. Lee body, Alzheimer's, frontal temporal. There you go, Grace. These are great guesses. A lot of different types of dementia. And I'm sorry to hear about your friend, Grace. My um, mom's best friend had it. Um, and it was, uh, it was really, it was really, really sad. So um, I thank you all for attending. This was a lot of fun. Um, I love talking about this stuff. Um, so like I said, if you have any questions, I can put my um, email address also in the chat. And like I said, I'm happy to stay for however long. Dr. Slifka, are you able to, to hear me? Yeah. I have, no, uh, I I have a question coming in in the um, question and answer box. Oh, um, okay. There's also the chat. Oh, okay. Um, but Annie was asking, um, what's the difference between neuro and psychological differences that we might see in an fMRI? I think, I think I might need a little bit more clarification there. I think that's a really hard question in general too, because I have trouble distinguishing between uh, psychological and neuro because of the control of the control from the, of the brain, um, of our behavior. So you said the question was the difference, the difference between neural, neural and physiological differences that you might see in an fMRI. So it's really tough to distinguish what they might be. So fMRI isn't very specific to what exactly is happening. And we're not able to see our main goal in an fMRI is to see visualize activity that's taking place at rest and um, during a particular activity, but not as clear on anatomy um, and actual like structure um, and function at the neuronal level. But what's happening in terms of the oxygenation changes? I'm not sure if that answers your question. We'll see if, um, if that's enough. If not, please type in the question answer box and um, we can go through a follow-up. Um, Dr. Slifka, I do wanna say um, thank you again for the presentation. Thank you to all of our audience for attending. Um, Dr. Slifka shared her email address. Um, if you do have questions for us here at Hawks Learning, you can get in contact with us at marketing at hawkslearning.com. Uh, we will be emailing out a link to the recorded version of this presentation if you missed part of it and or want to rewatch it. Um, I have one more question before we go. We the question is, which functional imaging technique has the least amount of statistical noise? Okay, I see the question. That's, so that's one of those cases where I would say, I know a lot, but I don't know everything. So in terms of what I have worked with, I have focused, my entire focus has been on structural neuroimaging. And so I haven't done specific analysis on any functional uh, neuroimaging techniques. So I don't want to give you an answer that is not the correct answer. So I know with an fMRI scan, you're going to get noise if there were, there's any sort of motion. But in terms of the statistics, I don't, know if I can say with 100% confidence if you're going to get less no noise with a PET scan over an fMRI scan. But if you want to send me an email, we can chat about it. I think that would be a really interesting discussion. But like I said, I don't want to give you, because I haven't run the specific stats, so I don't have that firsthand experience like I do with diffusion tensor imaging and uh, traditional MRI. I don't want to give you an answer that is not entirely accurate. So this is essentially what I I think, because I know an fMRI is noisy, but I'm not sure that there's advantages of PET with less noise. And that seemed to answer their question. And we had one more from Jason that if you look in the chat box, you can see it's a little bit longer. Um, so it may be easier if you're able to read it. Oh my gosh, my students would be so interested in talking to you about that. Um, 
Okay, so curious if any of your efforts connect to brain related research imaging related implicit bias. Um, so I just taught a social psych class and my students were able to dig up some of this. Um, there is research out there on um, implicit bias in neuroimaging. I don't, I specifically focus primarily on disease. And so differences um, in the brains of individuals with disease and without disease. But I think there, my students taught me, there is some interesting research out there on um, implicit bias and neuroimaging. Okay, well, I know we're getting to the end of the webinar. Again, I would in encourage everybody to uh, email Dr. Sliska if they'd like to continue to follow up. Um, thanks again for presenting today, and I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys.